All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. Today we have a star with us once more. We have Dr. Paul Merrick. He is the author of the uh, Math Plus Protocol, celebrated, decorated professor, doctor, and he is heading the ICU unit as well for the East Virginia Medical School. So uh, Dr. Paul Merrick uh, is uh, within the Department of Internal Medicine, and he is Chief Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine um, head. So Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Merrick, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ping King Bean. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I was uh, discussing with you before that you are the most favorite personality of the cool beans. So thank you for your work and thank you for the education that you are giving us. And thank you to the cool beans, the string beans. You are very, very welcome. Thank you for coming in. So for the today's discussion, what I wanted to start with is the... Uh, so for the cool beans, today we are going to talk about number one, COVID-19 management, number two, masks, and most importantly, we are going to talk about what Dr. Merrick calls post-COVID syndrome and what we have been calling long haulers. So please stick around for the long hauler discussion because that is really important. And that is what is the Math Plus Protocol revision in September 2 as well. So we'll discuss that. So Dr. Merrick, all yours. So we have here on the screen uh, ta target ACE2 and type 2 pneumocyte. And you were mentioning it is really important for all the healthcare professionals to understand that the viral phase versus the immune phase are different. So can you shed some light? Can you tell us uh, how to look at it, uh, look at yeah. this disease? So thank, thank you, Dr. Bean. So what, I think the focus today should be on timing. Oh. And I don't think folks understand the timing. You listen to the experts, you listen to people talking, and I don't think they realize how important timing is in terms of treatment. Could you go back to the slide before the next one? Yeah, that slide. So this is such an important slide and you'll see how it fits in. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, so maybe you're right. Maybe show, go back to the, the other slide you were on. This one? Yes, that's the one. Mm -hmm. So basically what happens is you get exposed to the virus. And as we'll see, this is a highly contagious virus. Hmm. You then have the incubation phase that lasts about five days. Hmm. Now, this thing goes into the symptomatic phase where patients have fever, malaise, cough, and and whatever. This, this lasts about eight days. Hmm. And then as you'll see, the virus stops replicating. And we'll come to this because hmm you have no active viral replication. Hmm. You then go into the symptomatic pulmonary phase and the late pulmonary phase. Now, the point about this is you have profound immune dysregulation, and this is not due to viral replication or viral cytopathic effect. Hmm. This is such an important concept. Hmm. The immune dysregulation is a result of the host response to dead virus. Hmm. The viruses are dead, and hmm. the host is responding to these dead viral fragments. Hmm. So that's why the distinction between the symptomatic phase, where the virus is actively replicating, hmm. then at about of eight days after symptoms, the host hmm. immune response, probably through cytotoxic T cells, the virus is dead. But hmm. patients still remain PCR positive. Hmm. Uh, if you if we go to the previous slide number, which we were looking at, yes. So basically what this does is looks at the PCR and looks at live virus by culture. Hmm. So the crosses are PCR hmm. and it's on a log scale. Hmm. So you can see that initially the first 10 days the PCR, the, the, the um, viral load is exceedingly high. We're talking about t 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 virons. Hmm. So that's a billion, hmm. a billion viruses per milliliter. So hmm. there's an enormous viral load. Hmm. The, the 
dark circles reflect those patients that have viral culture positive. Hmm. So you will see patients only have positive virus culture up until day eight. Hmm. Past day eight, all the viruses are dead. What hmm. you're picking up on the PCR is you're picking up d dead viruses. You're picking up RNA fragments. Hmm. So the fact that the PCR is positive hmm. does not mean the patients have li living replicating virus. What hmm. you're picking up is RNA fragments hmm. from all the gazillion dead viruses. Hmm. So this becomes really important because if you think about it, giving an antiviral drug when you have dead virus doesn't make sense hmm. because once the virus is dead, it's dead. You can't hmm. kill something that's dead. It's dead. Hmm. So hmm. giving antiviral therapy after day 8 to 10 of symptoms is completely dumb. Hmm. The same thing happens with convalescent, convalescent serum. Hmm. In giving antibodies to kill a virus that's dead is just not going to work. So hmm. it's absolutely critical to understand that antiviral therapies only work uh, in the first 8 to 10 days of symptoms. Hmm. And thereafter, they have minimal effect. Hmm. The symptomatic phase, which is the profound inflammatory response, hmm. is the host response to this enormous burden of hmm. dead viral debris. So hmm. it's viral RNA and proteins that the host mounts a profound inflammatory response. Hmm. So you go from a phase where you have viral replication, where you maybe want to kill the virus, Mm -hmm. to a phase where you want to dampen the immune response. Mm -hmm. And that distinction is just so important because the treatment approach is completely different. You can go to the next slide. So just a comment over here then, and, and that is when I see many of my friends, colleagues, um, other healthcare workers, in the ICU, maybe day 20, day 30, still trying to give remdesivirs or still trying to give antivirals, that would not then work really because there is no virus. You know, if you think about it, it's completely and utterly dumb. And that's the point that I'm trying to get to is that I can't tell you how many thousands of people in the ICU are getting remdesivir. And as I'll show you, the, 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 their own data tells us it doesn't work. And just by pure logic, we know it's not going to work because all the viruses are dead. And it's impossible to kill something that's dead, Dr. Mm -hmm. Bean. <laughs> I, so I is, think so, yes. This is another slide. Again, this is, I think, from nature showing mm -hmm. again exactly the same thing. The red dots are positive viral culture. So you can see the virus can only be cultured up until the 10th day whereas the PCR remains positive for a profound period of time. So the mm -hmm. fact that you PCR positive does not mean you have live replicating virus. It's a very important point. Hmm. That, so, that is such a great thing. So that means that when we are trying to give remdesivir in this kind of an area, we are really trying to kill the PCR itself, not the virus, because the virus itself is already dead. Exactly. You're treating dead virus. And, mm. you know, Gilead doesn't want you to know this because they want you to use as much remdesivir as you can use. Mm. But it's completely wasted. Mm. And you'll see the next slide again confirms this. This is a really interesting study. What they did in Taiwan mm. is they took people who were COVID positive. Mm. They then traced all of their contacts mm. to see what days the contacts became or contact with the index case, what day they became infective. Hmm. And, and your patients were only infective or, or, or transmitted the disease up until day five or six, which hmm. fits in with what I've told you. Hmm. So once you have, the, you, you know, in that, in that, Asymptomatic phase, you can see people are, are infectious. So mm. these asymptomatic people and in the incubation period is when you're infectious. Mm. But after day five, 
you don't have active virus, so mm. you're no longer infectious, which mm. again confirms what I've just told you, mm. that after about day five, the load of viable replicating virus is much lower and you can't transmit the disease. Got it. So yes. it's such an important concept because mm -hmm. you have the first phase of viral replication. Mm -hmm. The virus mm -hmm. then stops replicating and then the inflammation is due to the dead virus. And if mm -hmm. you think about it, there are trillions and trillions of dead virus, mm -hmm. with trillions of all this debris of RNA and the mm -hmm. host is responding, the macrophages, and T cells are responding to all this viral debris, hmm. and that's what's causing this profound inflammatory response. Very and interesting. It's truly interesting and truly astonishing. Hmm. So it's not, you know, it's not actually the virus which is killing the host or killing the lung. And we know this from autopsy studies. There's very little direct cytopathic effects. So let me ask you a question then. Uh, we still see people who are, let's say, Math Plus is being used. We are still seeing people dying. Uh, of course, the, the rate is less. Of course, the number of people dying is less. What is, is it a timing issue or is it yes. the comorbidities? What is it that there are still some people, unfortunately, who become a victim? Yes, so that is a good question. So maybe let's go through the next slides and then we'll talk about that. So this is basically, you know, basically what I've said, and it's kind of reproducible. This is days of symptoms. You know, you have from symptom on test, you have fever for about 12 days. You then have cough for about 18 days. But you can see the shortness of breath begins at gate seven or eight. And that's when the virus has stopped replicating. You can see how important it is. So mm. the pulmonary phase starts once the virus is replicating. Now you can see it starts on day eight with shortness of breath. Mm. So timing again, mm. it's absolutely critical you start your steroids on day eight. Mm. So what we know is if you start steroids late, Hmm. They've already developed severe inflammatory response. And hmm. the train has left the station. They have such, the more you wait, the more intense the inflammatory response becomes. Hmm. So that's why it's really timing is so important. Timing, timing, timing. You've hmm. got to start your remdesivir if you're going to use it early. Hmm. But once you reach the pulmonary phase, remdesivir is gone. You've got to start steroids. It's hmm. really important. So mm -hmm. one of the problems is that people start steroids too late. Mm -hmm. There was a study recently done in Brazil, which was mm -hmm. with steroids, which was negative. It was started on day 13. Can you see where day 13 is? And yeah. the patients have been on a ventilator for three days already. Mm -hmm. why, why would you do such a thing? Mm -hmm. So you need to start treatment early. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, why do some patients do worse? And I think it's a combination of things. I think the viral load. The viral load is very important. The higher the inoculum, the greater viral replication. The higher the viral load, the more viral debris you're going to have and the greater inflammatory response. So the viral load is important, and I'll show you how we can reduce that. Secondly, I think there's some risk factors. Obesity is a terrible risk factor. Mm. We know that male sex is a risk factor. Mm. Age is a risk factor. Mm. So I think there are a number of factors which make it worse. Mm. So which really interesting, women have a much more dampened inflammatory response. Mm. So if you look at the cytokines of men versus women, mm. estrogen suppresses macrophage function. So women have much lower cytokine levels. That mm. probably explains why women do better than men. Obesity mm. is a terrible risk factor, particularly in young people. And it's probably because of the increased inflammatory response. Mm. So there are some people that do badly, and it's because of this overwhelming inflammatory response. So the first thing is to start steroids early, and if they're not responding to escalate the dose, mm. 
So the problem with the recovery studies is a fixed dose, which I think mm. is wrong. Mm. You know, I, no two patients are the same. Mm. You would agree with me. So yeah. some patients yeah. just need a higher dose. So mm. you, we use methylprednisolone. We start off with a loading dose of 80 and then 40 a day. If the patient's not getting better within 24 hours, we escalate the dose rapidly. Mm. Now, what we found is there are some patients that despite steroids and vitamin C and all the, 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 all the other goodies we add, the full Monty, really have this overwhelming inflammatory response, mm. which could be part of their genotype and the risk factors. What we do in those patients is we plasma exchange them. So we found that the, these, and it's not, it's a small percentage of patients. We've done maybe 15 to 20 patients who have overwhelming infection, which mm. doesn't seem that we can get under control. Those patients, we do plasma exchange. Mm. And remarkably, it seems to work well because you're taking out the bad humors mm. and giving back good humors. Mm. So, you know, that is a, you know, obviously it's not a first line therapy, but in the U.S., I think, and other countries that can do it, it's something to consider. And there have been increasing reports of the use of plasma exchange. But I think, you know, if you start early, mm -hmm. you know, we, as soon as the patient has respiratory symptoms, mm -hmm. they've entered the respiratory phase, mm -hmm. that's when you want to hit them with steroids. I think that's, that's so right. important. Got it. Got it. So I think this, this is, is a huge takeaway, even for the whole discussion today. today treat the virus in the viral phase and treat the immune system in the immune phase and reversing these treatments can actually be fatal for the patient. Absolutely. So as we'll see, we, we know from the recovery study, if you use steroids hmm. in patients who weren't on oxygen, they did worse. Hmm. So you're giving steroids when the virus is replicating. It's just going to make the virus replicate more. Mm. So that's why you don't want to reverse the order. And I think the same holds for inhaled steroids. It doesn't make sense to give inhaled steroids mm. during the symptomatic phase because you haven't gone to the inflammatory phase yet and you're just going to promote viral replication. So if you yeah. go to the next slide, I think we have this nicely shown. Um, so you know that the symptomatic phase is antiviral therapy. That's what works. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, whether you use remdesivir or ivermectin or interferon, you know, it doesn't matter. So you can look at interferon. Interferon mm -hmm. likely works early. Mm -hmm. There's a study with interferon given late and actually may have been harmful mm -hmm. because it's an antiviral. So mm -hmm. it's very important to distinguish these two phases, mm -hmm. the viral replication and then the virus is stopped. All you have is these trillions of pieces of viral debris. It's the viral debris phase in which you get this profound immune dysregulation. Mm -hmm. And I think that distinction is so important to appreciate. So using remdesivir at this phase or monoclonal antibodies or, or a convalescent serum just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you listen to the experts speak and they never talk about this. And this is what is also interesting. I have seen a few cases in the ICU where as they kept becoming critical, they kept trying to give them more convalescent plasma and more remdesivirs and more of those kind of things. And they would probably be just doing nothing. And even the placebo effect is going to be negative because now we think we are doing something and we are actually... Um, Absolutely. Using, uh, crucial time to actually do something good for the patient. Yeah, so the problem then is that overwhelming inflammation. These people mm -hmm. have profound inflammation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's absolutely remarkable how high the CRP and ferritin go. They, mm -hmm. There's no other disease we know that is quite like this. You know, gram-negative sepsis mm -hmm. is child's play. You treat it, it goes away. And I think it's because there's so much viral debris mm. that the host is phagocytosing mm. and responding to. You have overwhelming inflammation. So what you want to do is give anti-inflammatory therapy, you mm. know, steroids, vitamin C, plasma exchange, 
whatever anti-inflammatory therapies you want to give, hmm. you know, giving, you know, trying to shoot these patients with convalescent serum just does not work. Got it. Very, very important. So for the cool beans here, if this is clear, I think you have a great takeaway from the discussion today. If this is not clear, as we continue on having more discussions, please re-watch the recorded part in the beginning. The takeaway has to be there is a viral phase and there is an immune dysregulation phase. Treat the virus in the viral phase and treat the immune system in the immune phase. Any imbalance in that management can be fatal. Got okay, it. Go to the next slide. I think, again, it kind of reinforces this, mm -hmm. that you have viral replication, mm -hmm. which, which then decreases. So you have this paradox. Mm -hmm. As the virus is stopping replicating, you have the marked increase in the inflammatory response. So what you want to do is you want to start treatment early when the patient starts developing pulmonary signs. Hmm. Hmm. It's not rocket science, actually. Hmm. So that's hmm. why, you know, you monitoring the O2SATs hmm. is so important. And once patients start developing pulmonary signs, hmm. it means they're de getting into the severe inflammatory phase and you have to quell the inflammation. It's hmm. like a fire. And the longer hmm. you wait to pull out the, put the fire out, the more hmm. destruction the fire has caused and the more difficult to put out the fire. Hmm. Hmm. Makes sense. Let's go to the next slide, which again shows it again. So this is really, again, important because, <laughs> you know, people get a PCR and they hmm. think that this is active viral replication. So this slide again shows you that the PCR likely is positive for three weeks, hmm. but the PC, but the virus has stopped replicating. Hmm. The other thing that is really important, which hmm. people don't recognize, is the false negatives. Hmm. So if you have a look at the peak, which is on about, again, you know, it's on about day eight of the exposure, hmm. only about 80% of people with COVID will be PCR positive, hmm. 80%. So we have many patients who have all the features of COVID and hmm. you can test them six or seven times, they remain PCR negative. Hmm. So COVID is essentially a clinical diagnosis. The hmm. PCR is there to help support you, hmm. but a negative PCR does not exclude COVID. It's such an important mm. point. That's a very important thing. And if you think about it, 20% of people who are negative actually have COVID. Mm. And then you can see that the antibody response kind of kicks in once the virus has stopped replicating, obviously indicating that the development of cell-mediated immunity from B cells and T cells. Mm. So mm. this, you know, this follows the end of viral replication got it got it so let's go to the next slide and i think th this this is um you know here's the data so this is the remdesivir study published in the new england journal of medicine hmm. the first thing that's interesting is this is a preliminary report hmm. we do not have a follow-up report hmm. which is somewhat curious and i suspect they don't want to give us the follow-up report Otherwise, if the data was very positive, mm. they would have. Mm. The endpoint in this study was not mortality. Mm. It was time for resolution of symptoms. Mm. And really, that's a very unpatient-centered endpoint. Mm. And you can see that the only patients in whom the course was shortened was patients mm. not receiving oxygen. This is from their publication. Mm. You can see patients on oxygen or on mechanical ventilation. There was absolutely no difference in any outcome with mm. remdesivir. Mm. No outcome. <clears throat> and the reason is that patient was in the immune dysregulation instead of viral replication phase. Yes. So, you know, what I mean, I think the data speaks for itself. Mm. I think it's absolutely there on the screen and it's clear and obvious. Remdesivir, which is an antiviral, has m no effect once patient has transitioned into the pulmonary phase. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So this is the this is the result showing for the pulmonary phase, and remdesivir is doing nothing. So this idea that as the patient becomes more critical, let's find and give them remdesivir is actually counterproductive. It makes no sense. It means that people don't understand the disease they're treating. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the data. There's the data. The data speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And the effect of remdesivir is not a mortality reduction. It mm. was a shortening of the duration of symptoms or time to recovery. Mm. And most patients want to recover. Whether mm. it takes them six days or eight days, they don't really care. They just want to yeah. get better. So you can see the, the, the impact of this really expensive drug. Mm -hmm. Really expensive drug is actually quite marginal. Mm. And I think that not only just that, it is actually counterproductive or destructive as well, because if we think that this is a silver bullet and keep trying to use it in all phases, it is actually going to cause harm because it will not do what we think it will do. Exactly. You're waiting for something to work that's not going to work, hmm. whereas you could be doing something else which would work. So you, you're using an ineffective therapy and waiting for an ineffective therapy to become it effective and it's not going to work. Hmm. Totally makes sense. Okay, next slide. So now this is the opposite. So hmm. this is dexamethasone. Hmm. Okay, so you can see that this is mortality now. This is hmm. mortality. Hmm. So you can see dexamethasone reduces mortality on patients on a ventilator. It reduces mortality on patients on oxygen. Hmm. Next slide. However, if you look at patients not on oxygen, it actually, there was a trend towards harm. Hmm. Do you hmm. see that over there? Yeah. So it's on the other side, usual care better. Hmm. So it's very clear again, corticosteroids are beneficial on ventilation and when you're getting oxygen, but when you're not receiving oxygen, I mm. you don't have pulmonary involvement, mm. there was a trend towards harm, which again fits in exactly with the the contextual frame we're developing, that the mm. treatment is very phase specific. Mm. You don't want to use steroids in the viral replicative symptomatic phase, mm. and you don't want to use remdesivir in the pulmonary phase. They're mm. not going to work. Mm. Very, very important, and I think this can be the difference in life and death for a patient. Absolutely. And the treatment is obviously time, very time sensitive. So the steroids, you want to start exactly at the right time. So that's why timing is so important. Mm. Very okay. interesting. The next slide was just something we put together because, you know, people are pushing dexamethasone. We mm. much prefer methylprednisolone. So this is a summary of studies using dexamethasone, methylprednisolone, and hydrocortisone. Mm. And you can see that the number needed to treat is much less with methylprednisolone than with dexamethasone. Mm. So I think this slide shows that clearly. Mm. So we, we strongly recommend the use of methylprednisolone Hmm. You recommend a higher dose, and hmm. then if the patient has this out-of-control inflammatory response, hmm. you do the logical thing. You just increase the dose because they have a profound inflammatory response. This is a hugely important data set here that it is showing, for example, if I see here methylprednisone ICU patients, number needed to treat 6.2, and over here dexamethasone number needed to treat to save one life 28.6 yes this is a huge difference and if you actually have a look mm -hmm. at the icu patients you look at the mortality 7.2 percent you can mm -hmm. see how low that is compared mm -hmm. to 20 percent with dexamethasone so it's real i mean this is really making a real difference in mortality so mm -hmm. i think the reason you may have been seeing patients dying is the wrong steroid in the wrong dose given too late and mm. stopped too early. Well, wow. so I think steroid is such an important uh, 
medication in, in terms of saving lives. And so it's not just any steroid. The type or, or the class of steroid is also very important. So methylprednisolone is better than dexamethasone, as we can see here in the data. Yes. And I think there's really good genomic data to explain that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, firstly, methylprednisolone penetrates much better into the lung, much better. Mm -hmm. So COVID mm -hmm. affects the lung, folks, mm -hmm. little course. beans. So, and you want the drug to get to the organ that you want it to influence. So mm. methylprednisolone has much better penetration into the lung than the other steroids. And mm. also it binds differentially to the glucocorticoid receptors mm. and has greater anti-inflammatory effects in patients with SARS. Got it. So that, that once again, so uh, cool beans here, the health professionals here, this is the gold standard, in my opinion, for approaching the management of COVID-19 and saving lives. So please check out the kind of medicine to use, the phase of medicine to use, and the, and the urgency of the right medicine to be used at the right time. Yes, I think you put it, you've articulated it really well. It's urgent. <laughs> You have to think about the right medicine at the right time. Correct. Makes sense. Makes sense. We, we actually, uh, I'm just going to make a point to the cool beans. I think we have to, so far we've been discussing things with each other, uh, helping uh, protect and save each other and our loved ones. I think we have to take up Math Plus as a mission to spread it to others and bring it to as many people, as many doctors, as many ICUs as we can, and create a bigger impact. Yeah, you know, what you're saying is true. You know, when we started pushing steroids, you know, people poo-pooed us, and they said we were, what we're doing was wrong, it was harmful. But I think there's now overwhelming evidence. Mm -hmm. I think there's now overwhelming evidence mm -hmm. that corticosteroids save lives. Mm -hmm. But they save lives in the pulmonary phase. Makes sense. So tell us a little bit before we go to the next uh, slide. So the next slide is just a, and a follow on. So this hmm. was actually the Brazilian study I spoke about. Hmm. So you can see this was a negative <laughs> study. But why was it negative? They hmm. started on day 13. So we can see on day 13, patients had likely had pulmonary symptoms for five or six days. Hmm. And they were it was day three on a ventilator. So hmm. they should have started much earlier hmm. and then they only treated them for five days hmm. Hmm. so you know if you use even if you use the right drug but you use it in the wrong dose and too hmm. too late and for too short a period of time it's hmm. not going to work so therefore you can see how important timing is hmm. timing is so important you want to start at the right time the right dose and for the right period of time so I think this is very, very important. Right time, right dose, right period of time. So you cannot stop it early. You cannot give the incorrect steroid type. You cannot give the wrong dose. And you cannot start it at the wrong time. These are all, they have to be with precision. And this would only happen when you take interest in your patient, when you want to make sure that you're saving their lives. Yeah, so I think what you say is so true. You have to think about the patient in front of you. You know, each patient is different. Where are they? What are their risk factors? And where are they in the spectrum or what phase are they in? It's really important. Makes sense. So we're going to change gears now. Hmm. So I get a lot of emails from people who have had COVID two months, three months, four months. Mm. And they tell me they are not back to normal. Mm. They feel bad. They feel tired. They feel lethargic. And so this is a real syndrome. And this, this is, is the, a, my apologies for interjecting, for the cool beans here, because we've been using the term long haulers. This is the long haulers discussion now. Really important. Maybe we can actually take this part of the video's clip and separately publish it as well. So we are talking long haulers now, which Dr. Marek is calling it post-COVID syndrome. Yes, please. Uh, my apologies for the interjection. Yes, no, sure. So the, these, so 
these are people that have had COVID and they could be symptomatic people or patients with pulmonary disease who mm. persist in having symptoms. Mm. And you know, this is a nice table which shows you that post COVID, so these are people post COVID, mm. almost 60% have fatigue. They're mm. tired, they're lethargic, they don't have energy and it affects the quality of life. Mm. About 50% have shortness of breath. They have joint pains, they have cough, they have headache. So you can see that there's a vast spectrum of symptoms. So the question is, why do they have all of these symptoms? So nobody has really addressed it, you know, so I can give you some of my speculation and it's only speculation. So, I mean, I don't have proof. So my theory is, is that because these patients have Mm. such a profound inflammatory response Mm. that these people have ongoing low-level inflammation, Mm. which is causing these symptoms. Mm. So we know in patients who have gram-negative sepsis, that if you look at their cytokine profile one year after the episode, they still have elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, Hmm. which is what is causing all of these symptoms. Hmm. So my theory is that perhaps they weren't treated with steroids appropriately up front, Hmm. or the steroids were stopped too quickly. Hmm. So my first recommendation is to check the CRP. Hmm. And I think if the CRP is elevated, Hmm. this means that the patients still have ongoing inflammation. And this is such an important thing. Uh, Once again, my apologies for the interjection here. I have some patients who have gone in long hauling state or in the post COVID-19 syndrome, as you're saying, Uh, what I saw was that when the young ones, if I use steroids, I use Delta Cotrel with them, they very quickly recover. However, those patients who may have comorbidities or who may have uh, other inflammations going on, this is what I've observed. For example, one of my patients had an arm surgery before he developed COVID. <laughs> Excuse me. And since the COVID, he has recovered from COVID, but that surgery where the inflammation was going on is now sticking there. The inflammation is sticking there for two and a half months. So it looks like they get stuck in the inflammatory state and it doesn't go away. Yeah. So I think there are a few tricks. So we have a few tricks on our sleeve on how to deal with this inflammation. So you can see the way we deal with the inflammation now is somewhat different when they're in ICU. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's a different kind of a problem. So um, we'll come to what we do. The other thing that these people have is they have a high risk of clotting, both DVTs and PEs and strokes and all kinds of things. They have a high risk of clotting. Hmm. So what we suggest is that um, on discharge, Hmm. you measure their D-dimer, you look at their age, you risk stratify them, Hmm. and there there is a place for extended thromboprophylaxis. Hmm. So what to do, open up your... Yeah, there we go. So patients have an increased risk of thromboembolic events after discharge. Hmm. So you need to think of extended thromboprophylaxis. Hmm. Hmm. And I think this is the place that NOx or DOx may have a role because it's much easier. Hmm. So, you know, patients who on discharge have a high D-dimer, interestingly hmm. enough, CRP increases your risk of clotting. Hmm. If your age is more than 60 and you've had prolonged immobilization, which applies to most COVIDs, these people are at a really high risk of developing thrombotic events. Hmm. And I think it's a disaster when the patient goes home and comes back two days later with a massive PE. Hmm. So I think this is really um, an important aspect which we've now identified. Hmm. Hmm. This is so really, think, really important. Yes, please. Yeah, so I think <laughs> patients need to be risk stratified on discharge. Do hmm. they need a DOAC? And for how long? You know, I would say at least at least four weeks, but I mm. think it has to be considered. Mm. We then go to the post-COVID syndrome that we spoke about. 
Hmm. So we have a few new little tricks. Hmm. So apart from apart from the steroid, hmm. I think that omega-3 fatty acids are really important because hmm. omega-3 fatty acids, part of their metabolic products are things called resolvins and protectins. Hmm. And these are uh, lipid products that actually enhance healing. Hmm. So these are breakdown products from omega-3 fatty acids hmm. that promote healing and resolution of inflammation. These the, the molecules are called resolvins hmm. and they buy products of omega-3 fatty acids. Hmm. So I would give these people omega-3 fatty hmm. acids. The yeah. other thing which is interesting hmm. is statins increase resolvent synthesis. So you use a statin plus omega-3s, it may work in combination. Hmm. Now, obviously, you know, what I'm telling you now is, you know, just makes basic sense. Hmm. I think it's probably safe. Hmm. It's intuitively obvious. I have no data to support this. Got but, it. you know, when you're faced with a situation of patients who are suffering, hmm. you can't just let them be. You have to do something. Correct. So you want to do something that is safe hmm. and is potentially helpful. Hmm. So hmm. I think, you know, you, you would consider a, a short course of steroids hmm. with omega-3s and atorvastatin. Obviously, I would hmm. continue the melatonin and their, multiple, their B vitamins, particularly, you know, so I would recommend a, you know, B complex and vitamin D. Hmm. I, I love it. So uh, my own experience from outpatient you know, long haulers, uh, Delta Cotrill has been very, very successful. But in a couple of cases where it did not do the job right away, I am actually going to try these as well. Yeah, I think you have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the other thing that 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 is truly astonishing and completely disturbing and very worrisome, mm -hmm. there was a study which did MRIs three mm -hmm. or four weeks after patients were discharged, mm -hmm. and fifty percent of patients had evidence of MRI of dysfunction, micro mm -hmm. infarcts and MRI abnormalities. Hmm. So, you know, the COVID is a very serious disease. This is not the flu. And hmm. I think, you know, we think of the acute events, but hmm. this disease has long-term consequences. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me this, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, is there some real good management for pulmonary fibrosis? So we don't know. So this was, this was, you know, there are some patients, you know, if you start late, who are going to get severe pulmonary fibrosis. Mm. So a few people have, you know, we do have pulmonologists have antifibrotic agents mm. that you, we use for, you know, interstitial fibrosis. Yeah. So I think that if patients do have evidence of um, pulmonary fibrosis, they should be referred to a pulmonologist. Who can then? Because this is this is quite complicated medicine. There are a number of any fibrotics that may be of benefit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worthwhile trying. But I think, you know, the general practitioners in turn shouldn't be doing this. They need to be referred to a pulmonologist. Got it. And and for the uh, cool beans here, um, uh, cool beans. I have the link to this document. This is Math Plus Protocol updated on second September. And the link is in the description. Uh, Dr. Marek, would you like to talk a little bit about the masks as well? Yes. And so, you know, I think <laughs> this has become such an important issue. So, you know, and, and I think people take it for granted. So there was a really interesting study. What they did is they looked at people breathing. People just breathing, like you and I and everyone else is doing now. They were not coughing. They were not speaking. They were not sneezing. Hmm. They were not exhaling. They were just breathing. Hmm. And they measured the condensate. Hmm. The condensate in someone who is breathing hmm. contains over a billion viruses. Oh, B, wow. billion. Hmm. 
So if we, if we have a mirror in front of me while I'm breathing, that condensation that would be there can have more than a billion viruses in it. Yes. Wow. So you know what? I think it tells us how infectious this disease is. Mm -hmm. It tells us how rapidly this virus replicates in the upper airways. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, th this is completely different to the flu. This is why it's so contagious why it spreads so quickly mm. and that the higher the viral load the worse the disease got it so there is absolutely no question of doubt mm. the only way to control this pandemic mm. is for universal masking mm. you know it's not a political thing mm. it's it's just common sense the only way we're going to control this mm. is by wearing a mask mm. The interesting thing about wearing a mask is it doesn't only protect other people, it mm. actually protects the wearer. Mm. Because what happens is if you wear a mask, obviously it's not an N95, so it doesn't stop all viruses, mm. but it significantly decreases the viral load. Mm. So if you wear a mask, you're much, much more likely to have an asymptomatic infection than a symptomatic infection. I love it. So, can I? Um, can I? And you go to the next slide, and I'll show you a really interesting observation. So, this is called the tale of two cruises. Hmm. So, as you know, the Diamond Princess was the ship stuck off the coast of Japan. Yeah, uh, there was the first ship. Nobody wore masks when they tested the people. Hmm. About twenty percent of all the infections were asymptomatic. The rest hmm. were all symptomatic. Hmm. <clears throat> there was an Argentinian ship that went to the Antarctic. Hmm. It was another cruise ship hmm. that, that had an outbreak. But hmm. what happened on this ship is every single person was forced to wear a mask. Hmm. When they tested them, 81% of the infections were asymptomatic. There well, were far, far fewer symptomatic, but most of them were asymptomatic. So it's telling that. you... If you wear a mask, hmm. you have a decreased viral load. Hmm. The viral load or inoculum size is one of the most critical factors in determining the outcome of the disease. Because the higher the viral load, the more it replicates. And then once you kill the virus, the more viral debris you have. So wearing a mask protects you as well as your fellow citizens. So I think, you know, the question of masks is no longer a question. So this is a this is a very important point here. Even this morning, I was speaking with someone uh, from Tunisia. And he was uh, he was conjecturing. He was hypothesizing. He was saying he he feels that if the initial load of the virus is less, then our immune response is less as well. And we recover with milder symptoms compared to becoming severe. And if the initial loads are high and the replication has really been great, then we go into those dysregulated and severe cases. And that, that is, I think, what you are talking about here as well. Absolutely, absolutely, there's no question. So the viral load is so important. The higher the load, the more viruses you have, the more inflammation you have. So you want it try and decrease your viral load and try and prevent transmission. So then can I paraphrase this this way, that if the cool beans here, if we wear masks and kind of reduce the amount of exposure, then it is possible that even if we get it, we would actually get out of it with lesser price to pay, maybe asymptomatically or with lesser symptoms compared to becoming aggravated and in the ICUs. It is possible. There is a potential. I think absolutely. And the other thing people forget is, you know, mm -hmm. when we get a vaccine, if we ever do get a vaccine, and that's if we do, it's not going to be 100% effective. It may be 70%. Mm -hmm. So we still need to wear masks mm -hmm. because it's still going to be circulating. Mm -hmm. So we stuck with masks, whether we like it or not. I think we just got to get used to them. Mm -hmm. We have to accept it that mm. this is the only way we're going to control the pandemic. This is not some kind of a, a, a hoax. It's mm. not fake news. It's real. Mm. And I think people just have to be responsible mm. and wear masks. I think I, I can't see any other option. Makes sense. 
makes sense. So, uh, Dr. Marek, we have uh, you are on the East Coast. It is about 10 o'clock on your side. Is it OK if I can ask you a few questions that uh, folks had been asking? Sure. Uh, sure. So just a few few questions, and then we can break. So I'm going to just scroll over these uh, scroll these questions and see. Uh, apologies. There were uh, lots of questions that have. So there is a question about timing of melatonin. Yes. So, you know, I think we know there's a there's a good study that shows people who took melatonin were at a lower risk of developing uh, COVID. I think there's some data that melatonin decreases the severity of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I think that everybody should be taking melatonin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really cheap. Mm -hmm. And the worst that can happen is you can have a good night's sleep. So. Um, I think it, you know, it. in terms of prophylaxis, I think it's a good thing. And then obviously, once patients become symptomatic, maybe they increase the dose. Um, it. You know, it's so completely safe. It's mm. so completely safe. Um, some people may have bad dreams, mm. uh, and that's because of hyper REM sleep. All you then do is you decrease the dose somewhat. Um, Perfect. And I do recommend we recommend slow release because Got it gives it. you a much more normal melatonin pattern. Got it. Uh, next question. Um, should we wear oh, goggles? Wait, goggles. <laughs> you know what? I think there's one or two cases of some, a patient mm -hmm. spitting in a person's eye and transmitting COVID. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to live in the real world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if you, in the ICU, you, you're doing a procedure, then okay, you can wear wear goggles. But I think to wear goggles otherwise, I think is is cumbersome. The main route of transmission is droplet spread. There is some airborne spread. Most of it is droplet spread. So I think masks are so important. Maybe in certain circumstances, when you have direct contact with patients, wearing goggles is okay, particularly if you don't have glasses. But um, not, not. I think the more, most important is masks. Got it. In terms of fish oil, so you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a, you know, humans evolved on a diet much higher in omega threes than omega sixes. Hmm. You know, hmm. our Western diet is really bad, hmm. and I, hmm. I, and I really believe that omega threes are are have anti-inflammatory properties, hmm. are good for platelets, good for blood vessels. So. You know, I, I would take them prophylactically. Mm. I would take them when the patient is sick. Mm. And obviously in the uh, post-COVID syndrome, I think it's very important. So much like melatonin, mm. it's really mm. safe. Yes. And I think it can be helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got it. Got it. Couple of couple more of questions. More so questions. here is a question. So is a question. Who is developing, who is developing COVID, COVID syndrome? syndrome? Those hospitalized with serious symptoms only, meaning who is prone to this syndrome? Yes. So no, you know what? I mean, we, we have a respiratory therapist who got COVID who is at home and mm. speaking to her, she was never that sick. She never came to hospital. Mm. She is suffering. Mm. She is really fatigued and tired. And I get a lot of emails from people who are treated at home. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's people who have been in hospital, but also, you know, symptomatic patients who are treated at home mm -hmm. have the syndrome. And, and, I is, think, and I think these people are obviously less likely to have had received steroids. Yeah. So, you know, it's a really real syndrome and yeah. patients suffer. Yeah. And I have seen it. Um, I have seen mostly outpatient. And I have seen in many of my outpatient patients that they develop long haul sy syndrome. Fortunately, all of my long haulers have become uh, recovered. There is just one person who did not respond that fast to the first pulse of the steroids. And I'm going to try now uh, omega and the other statins as well. So two more questions. So here is a question. What can you do for inflammation without prescription meds? Most long haulers have no doctor care. 
Okay, well, you know, I think, you know, omega-3 fatty acids you can get from the pharmacy. Um, <clears throat> melatonin you can get from the pharmacy. You know, obviously, you know, the, you know, the steroids and statins, you do need a, a, a prescription, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So, you know, I think you've got to contact the great bean and he will, he will express you some medications. Mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, we live in a strange world. I think, you know, you need, these people should be followed by their primary care doctor because there may be other issues as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the primary care doctor can help them. Um, but well, obviously, you know, if you're limited, you know, I would say, you know, use omega threes, vitamin C for certain, you know, whatever you can can get hold of. Got it. And the final question, of course, there are a lot, lot more questions as well over here. We will try to get back with those questions another time too. One question: the ascorbic acid that you say. So this is by, from James Kelly. I had mentioned that question before as well. He he won, he's wondering that the ascorbic acid that you are you have in the Math Plus protocol, who is the manufacturer of it, or do, do you know the brand or yes. some more details? Uh, yes. Yeah. So so in the U.S. there are two um, formulations which are generally used, hmm. uh, two readily available um, formulations that are approved. The one is made by McGuff Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. called ASCO. The other one is by Myelin Pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. uh, and it's ascorbic acid. Those are the only two commercially available um, vitamin C preparations. Both of them are sodium ascorbate mm -hmm. and both of them do have some sodium bicarbonate for buffering. Mm -hmm. So the question was, you know, the, 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 the viewer was asking, can you get pure ascorbic acid without sodium? Mm -hmm. And it seems the answer is no, that the mm -hmm. The formulations available in the U.S. are sodium ascorbate, which then obviously when you inject it will dissociate into sodium and the ascorbate ion. Whether it makes a difference or not, I can't tell you. But unfortunately, those are the only formulations available in the U.S. Got it. So I saw a question about the dose of melatonin. Yes. And maybe I should answer that because it's kind of interesting. There's enormous difference in bioavailability between different people. So it undergoes, melatonin undergoes first pass effect through the liver. Hmm. So some people are rapid metabolizers and others are slow metabolizers and it's difficult to know. Hmm. So the recommended dose is about two milligrams at night. Hmm. But some people actually can go higher and other people can go lower. So a reasonable dose is two milligrams of slow release at night. I take one milligram because if I take a higher dose, I get really bad REM dreams. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to individualize it mm -hmm. and see what works best for you. You know, I wouldn't go higher than 10 milligrams. That doesn't make sense. So, you know, I would, I would start off at, you know, maybe two and see what happens. Got it. And uh, two questions, a little more, um, to your practice and f to you. So number one, uh, what uh, do you take any prophylaxis? Do you take any supplements? How do you keep yourself protected and healthy? Yes. Yeah, so I take vitamin C, quercetin, melatonin, omega-3s every day. Got it. And then the last question, do you test every one of your patients for vitamin D3 levels? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, I think it would be worthwhile doing that. Hmm. So I think we know what kind of patients are going to be vitamin D deficient. You know, hmm. if, if you're elderly, hmm. if you uh, are a person of color, hmm. if you're obese, you're likely to have low um, vitamin D levels. And also if you spend the time indoors, so, so you know, if you spend no time outdoors, so I think, you know, um, what I would say is, you know, taking 2,000 uh, units of vitamin D daily is pretty safe. Hmm. But if you think you're at, at a high risk of having really low levels, hmm. so, you know, you don't get out a lot, you may be elderly, um, it may be worthwhile checking a vitamin D level. Hmm. Hmm. Absolutely. Makes sense. 
So, Dr. Marek, thank you so much. You are actually our king bean, although you you call yourself a soy bean, but you are a king bean. Thank you very much for being with us. And th this has been such, I think just this talk is sufficient for the healthcare professionals to know how to manage their patients. Yeah. So, you know, I, I want to thank you because I think you're doing a great service. I think it's great for people to talk about this disease. And I think we need, we need to educate people. You know, this is a complicated disease. And I think people need to understand the disease. You can't treat something you don't understand. So people need to think about it. Hmm. And we need to spread the word. And I think you're doing a wonderful job. Perfect. Thank you very much. I am very, very honored to have you. We Cool Beans are honored to have you. And Cool Beans, I think we should take this as a mission, as a collective mission, to make sure that we spread the Math Plus protocol to as many as possible. This would not only save lives, I think this is the time to serve. So please join me, join Dr. Marek as well. Let us take this as our mission from this platform. Yeah, and just, just to finish off, Dr. Bean, I actually got an email two days ago from a gentleman in some distant part in India. He hmm. says he lives in a very impoverished part of India. Hmm. He doesn't have a access to expensive medicines. He said he's been using the Math Plus protocol, and he thanked me because he thinks it saved hundreds of lives. So, you know, that did give me some kind of, you know, satisfaction that, you know, people are listening. And if you know you, you 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 care, you can make a difference. Absolutely, and I think, uh, and I say it many many times. There are people at this time as well who are looking for cash grabs and the brand positions and everything. This is the time globally for the human race to try to rescue ourselves, help each other. Then we can go back to earning monies and we can go back to being whatever we want to be. This is the time to serve each other and help each other. So thank you very much. Please like, subscribe and share. Please share it to two or three people. Ask them to share it further, especially give it to the folks who are managing patients, doctors and the ICU doctors. This would really be a favor from you. Dr. Marek, once again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Bean.